Have you ever wanted to not only analyze your data, but add context and new information to it? Well, you can with Sigma input tables. The simplest way to think about an input table is if you had a spreadsheet that lived inside of your workbook or it lived inside of your data flow. In today's video, I'll cover what are input tables, some use cases for them, and some things to keep in mind when designing with them. But let's hop into it. Today, we'll start with the empty input tables, then I'll go through CSVs and linked input tables. They're all relatively similar with a few minor differences that can help either expand your use cases or make your life easier when you're developing. It's important to note that all input tables are writing back to your warehouse. So the first thing that we have to do when creating an input table is identify where we want to write the data to. So let's select an empty input table. You can see that Sigma is prompting me to select a connection. I'm going to select the Sigma sample database just as a demo, but in reality, you should use whatever your organization is using. If you are an administrator, you can decide which connections are available for input tables. As you can see, this is a blank input table. There's nothing in here yet. All we have is one column with a text field. One of the first things that I like to do when I'm creating an input table is rename this column. So we can double click in here and really call it anything. Now I can start to enter in rows of data by double clicking in here and adding my row one, my row two, and my row three. I'm just clicking enter return in order to go down to a new row. And if I click it again, you can see that Sigma automatically adds an option for that fourth row. In addition to adding new rows, I can also add new columns. You'll see here that we need to first identify what data type this column is going to be. So we've got the common or typical data types with text, number, date, and checkbox. A checkbox is going to be a Boolean field. So you can think about this as a true, false, yes, no, and we can see that over here. You'll also note that we can add columns by calculation. This is a really handy way to expand the analysis that is available with input tables. Anything that you can think of as a regular formula will be able to use for a calculation in an input table. So this could be something where it's maybe just for my, my simple example, we'll just want to see which rows contain the, the number one. So here we can see that we're getting a true and false in here. Keep in mind that these columns can always be hidden. So you, when you're presenting this to your end user, you could have a calculation that's going to be used for something else on the back end, and your end user may or may not see it. We can also add columns via lookups, which is a way kind of like a VLOOKUP from Excel, a way to combine different data sources. And then we also have a few system or automatically added options here. We can see that we have a last updated at and a last updated by. These are really important for auditing purposes because Sigma is just keeping track of every time we're changing something within an input table. So for example, if I come in here and I change this to actually be row five, you can see that my timestamp has changed. And so you'll never lose any records of anything that's going on in the back end. In your warehouse, Sigma is keeping track of all of the records of the rows of data and only surfacing the most recently updated one. So again, if I were to change this back to row one, we would only see the current record. So we'd only see row one, not row one and row five, and then another row one. Next, we've got a row ID. This is how Sigma is keeping track of those records. As you can see, it is kind of a big, long number, most likely not going to be used a ton. When we're looking at some more advanced use cases with input tables, we might start to want to reference some of these things. An example of that could be if we want to recreate or kind of surface that logged history, like what Sigma is keeping track in the back end, we want to do that in the front end. Once we have data in an input table, we can start to use it like we would any other data source within Sigma. So I can create a visualization or a table or pivot table off of this. Let's take a look at uploading a CSV into an input table to show another example. I can also upload a CSV into a not input table if I want to. I would do that by selecting a table and then just selecting the CSV as the source. But this would be an example of something where I might want to change some of the information or continue to add new entries to that CSV. So I'm going to select CSV. You'll see we have the same need to designate which connection it is. And then I'm just going to search for a document. We've got a list of dogs, their ages, breeds, and their favorite toys in here. So we'll click Save. 
And now that I'm in here, I can add some new records to this. So let me come down here and I'll add one of my dogs. We'll do Ruby. She's 12. She's a lab. You'll note that Sigma is giving me some predetermined or, you know, hey, you're already using this data somewhere else. It might be helpful or might be a pre-populated value. And her favorite toy by far is a tennis ball. So now I'm able to add more information and more context all within the same workflow without needing to know anything about uh, SQL or really anything on the back end of the warehouse. All I do is interact with this like I would any Excel or spreadsheet. Now let's take a look at a linked input table example. A linked input table is different from a blank input table in that we can use a linked input table to be sourced from an existing data source. So in the blank or CSVs, those are things that I'm kind of creating or adding data to Sigma for the first time. Let's take a look at our plugs electronic and see how we would use a linked input table to add more context or more information. Let's say I want to uh, do an analysis on whether or not we should keep a product around. I want to understand the uh, number of orders and um, maybe the total uh, sales associated with it. So first, what I need to do for that is to create my sales calculation, which is going to be quantity times price. We'll call this sales and I'll make that a dollar amount. And then I'm going to group by my product name. I'm going to pull in my sum of sales and I'm going to do account distinct of my order number. All right, so this tells me what is the total sales in the total order count for each product. I'm just gonna name these real quick. And now I want to go through each one of these rows and determine whether or not I should keep it. So with a linked input table, I can create basically an input table that's the child element or sourced from this data source. So I'm gonna select linked input table, and then we need to tell Sigma what makes a unique row in this uh, data source. So for our example, it's just the product name. You might want to do product name and region or, you know, any really anything that your data source has. You can also add more columns here. And then we need to identify what additional columns we want to include. I'm going to do sales and order count. If I were to include anything else down here, I would start to run into some issues where my granularity that I told Sigma of what makes something unique does not match up with the data. So Sigma is going to um, kind of give me some nulls or some errors or just kind of saying, you know, I'm not quite sure what you want. All right. So you can see that we've got these three columns that are sourced from our data source. And you can also see that Sigma is telling me which column is my unique identifier through this key. It also added a text field in here automatically in order to distinguish that this is the field that I want to start editing something in. In this example, I might want to use a data validated field in order to make it easy and standardized on how we want to proceed with each product. To do that, I'm going to create a text field or actually we've already got this one. So let's use this one. And just am clicking this downward facing arrow to access the menu. And we have this option for data validation. This lets me create a manual list, or if I've got something else that's already providing me with the list that I want to assign, I can also choose that. But let's do keep, retire, and maybe for now. <laughs> We're unsure of what we want to do. So you can see how this field is a little bit different in that we don't have that text field. It's not a free form field, but it is something that we are able to kind of do these predetermined values into an input table. This is really awesome when we're thinking about how do we provide uh, a spot for folks to interact with their data, but not in a sense that anyone would be able to enter anything into our warehouse. We start to run into some governance some, and honestly just some data cleanliness concerns in here. So this is a great kind of in-between step to let folks add meaningful context, but then not make our, our data run wild. With that, let's talk about how we would start to use these data sources or use input tables in a real world example. So you'll note up here that we've got some options to determine when an input table can be edited. Right now, we've got this input table set to be only edited in draft mode. And that's because we're using this as the first time we're entering in data. We can set this as the draft mode if we wouldn't want anyone to change any of the values at any point when the workbook is live. When we're talking about the data entry permission modes of draft and view slash explore mode, we're talking about the workbook mode not the mode of the input table itself. 
So right now I'm just in Explore. I need to save this as my input table demo video for you guys, and we'll save that one. And now you'll see that we're in editing mode. So again, this is the mode of the workbook. If I go to this published mode, you can see that we don't have any options in here. If I try and double click in here, Sigma's not gonna let me do anything because I haven't told Sigma that it's okay for folks to edit this. So let's edit here. And now let's change this to be editable only in view and explore mode. So this is really important when we're thinking about the process in which we create these and publish these is that this setting or this change of editable in draft mode versus publish mode is not committed to until we click publish in the workbook itself. So now it's published. If I try and change something in here, again, Sigma won't let me because I'm not in the mode I'm not in the workbook mode that I have told Sigma that this input table can be edited in. So let's go to the publish mode. And now that we're in this mode, we can see we have this edit data option. So even here, we're not defaulting to edit. Oh, someone can't accidentally, you know, enter something in without necessarily knowing it or clear a value or something like that. We have to click edit data. And now I have that option of those drop down menus. And we'll do this one as maybe. And again, you'll see this kind of orange arrow indicating that these changes haven't been published. They haven't been committed to. They're not saved in our warehouse yet. If we want to do that, we have to click this save button in order for those things to be tracked or kept. So this is to prevent something of, you know, hey, I want to do maybe and then I want to do keep and, and then I want to go back to maybe and no, wait, actually, I do want to retire it. We're not constantly pinging the warehouse or something. We're just going to go with the things that the end user has told us, yes, this is what I want this record to be. In addition to this setting of when a, an input table can be edited, in the account type section, you can also determine who can edit these input tables. So in it, you can say, hey, these are our managers who are going to go through and add all these pieces of information. You can also set some of the edit permissions within the workbook itself. So don't fear administrators, you have several layers of different options that you can let folks either um, interact with or not interact with input tables. Another option that you can always do is put something to edit mode and then move it to a tab that is hidden from your end users. So again, you'd be able to use that information within a workbook, but then your end users might not even know that it's in an input table. This has been a very simple introduction to input tables. Uh, a really great way to think about input tables is going to be an, a, a kind of a playground for folks to say, what if my number was this? What if it was that? And this allows folks to see the answers to those really quickly. Again, if you think about adding formulas on top of these or something like that, it's a really great way to create dynamic analysis. The other really interesting way to think about input tables is in an application sense. So because we have an option to add new rows to our warehouse and we can do we can insert new rows through actions and forms, which we'll cover in a different video. We have an ability to not only look at, analyze, and update information, but create new rows of data. Hopefully you enjoyed this uh, simple introduction to input tables. And be sure to check out coming videos about the additional use cases for input tables.